Hey everybody. Happy New Year. This is your old pal Steve Kosniewski. And I'm just making sure that we are online and live and going. Uh, so as soon as somebody gets here, if you could let me know in the chat if you can hear me and everything all right. Uh, usually these things go pretty well, but I, you know, technology being what it is, I would love to hear from a human being uh, rather than just hope everything is going great. So, 2021, New Year's Eve. What a year it's been. Um, I have accomplished a great deal this year, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot more next year as well. Um, but let's toast it here at the end of the video here, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, okay, looks like I've got one viewer. Um, so if you could, whoever my viewer is, or no, I've got two now. That's exciting. Uh, if you could post something in the comments to let me know if you're hearing me all right, um, I'd appreciate that. But that being said, at the end of the video, and we'll go as long as uh, there is desire, uh, maybe... Everybody's busy celebrating with their friends and family tonight. Um, this, I feel a little weird with the camera here. I'm not. I'm not in my old setup, which we'll get to in a second here. Um, but yeah, that's that's all right. I'll try and get this all worked out at some point. Um, so it's not like this. Okay, I've got one like. Uh, so that sounds like somebody. Where the hell are the comments? Well, kind of half-assing it as usual. Nothing new there. Okay, so at the end of the video, which will go for however long that there is interest. Ah, oh, here we go. Here's a comment. So maybe that'll... God damn it. Now how do I read it? You can tell how great I am at this. I, it's not so much that I don't know how to use Facebook. It's that I feel like people... Like Facebook is constantly changing... And it's just little things like this that I can't, you know, like, where are my comments that are live? Wouldn't that be great to see? Uh, all right, here's my comments. Ugh, all right, well, I guess it's not going to be great <laughs> back and forth with folks if I can't figure out how to read this, but... Uh, sorry, I know there's nothing better than uh, dead air. Ah, here we go. C.A. Hoax says, hi, I'm good. Okay, great. Thanks, C.A. Okay, found the comments. <laughs> I was about to start over. Um, so, let's go ahead and charge our glasses for the toast at the end of the stream. So, I, of course, have my old crow uh, shot glass for fans of Brain Eater Jones. Um, that is actually what I usually drink on the regular. Um, and I will, of course, fill this up with some old crow. So go ahead and charge your, gra your glasses, ladies and gentlemen. And we will say goodbye to 2021 and hello to 2022. So it has been quite a year. Um, now, last year, if anybody uh, re can remember that far back, I did have a little uh, visitor, so I left the door open just in case Kiko or the other cat, Callie, wants to come in and say hello. Um, I'm not thinking that she will this year, although she is a bit of a glory hog, so she might just. Um, but we'll see about that. So, in terms of my author stuff this year... I, you know, it didn't feel like a huge year, but I actually got quite a bit published. So the first thing came out in January, which was not that. It was Bludgeon Tools. Bludgeon Tools from Evil Cookie Publishing. And this featured Brian Keane, Matt Shaw, Rath James White, Christopher Triana... 
couple of other people. Jonathan Butcher. Um, let me see if there's anybody else big. Uh, yeah, Christine Morgan. A lot of great um, extreme horror authors. So the subject of that was uh, tools. Um, and for that one, I wrote a little story called Tool Story. And that came out in January. And uh, Tool Story was my take on uh, the Pixar classic Toy Story. Um, so what my feeling was with the Bludgeon Tools was my guess was going to be that most people were going to take that as an opportunity to have somebody use tools in a violent manner on somebody, you know, uh, in terms of extreme horror. With Tool Story, I made the tools the heroes of the story. So there was a hammer, a wrench, and a pair of pliers that were all sentient, essentially, in the same fashion as in Toy Story. And uh, they were all owned by a mafioso who used them to torture people and then they kind of end up, uh, you know, full of themselves and end up on the wrong end of uh, a bunch of construction, uh, blue, more blue collar uh, construction tools at a construction site. Um, so that was a fun little story. Um, in ter other terms of publications, another Evil Cookie classic was uh, Gorefest which came out in, I want to say, September, October, right before Halloween. And Gorefest is another great table of contents. Uh, Daniel J. Volpe, Armand Rosamilia, Rath James White again, Jonathan Butcher again, uh, Wes Southerd, good friend. Um, I just talked to him earlier tonight, to him and Triana, actually. Um, so for Gorefest... I actually submitted a piece called uh, Sun Poison, which is a piece that I wrote, I don't know, uh, a year, maybe 18 months ago. And uh, Sun Poison was this story about a woman who, uh, you know, from her perspective, she kind of goes onto a beach and realizes she's in kind of a different dimension, a Lovecraftian kind of dimension where... Um, the, the sun is extremely powerful or else or the, her skin is extremely um, weak to it or something and her skin just starts sloughing off and she's reduced to like a skeleton and it's kind of a combination of body horror and um, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, Lucille. Oh, hey, Lucille. I remember Lucille from Scares. So those sound like a bunch of Scares that Cares authors may have to pick them up if you are going. Well, thanks for the comment. Uh, yes, I will be at, well, pandemic, uh, you know, permitting. I will be at Scares That Cares August this year, and I'm also planning to attend the brand new Scares That Cares author con in April. So, yeah, here's hoping. And, uh, yeah, we should have, I'm sure we can get you copies of those. Um, so, I actually uh, got a rejection for Sun Poison, for Gorefest. Um, and the, uh, the editor was very nice, and he was like, I, I love your work. I did not think this piece was right for this uh, collection, or anthology, rather. Okay, Lucille says I'm going to both. To, that's to both uh, Scares That Cares in August in West Virginia and Scares That Cares AuthorCon in April in West Virginia. So great, we'll see you there, Lucille. Um... So, the editor was actually not interested in that story that I did. You know, and whatever, it's, you know, that happens and that's fine. Um, but then he said, I want you in this collection. You've been in every Evil Cookie collection so far and I want you in this one. Can you send me your award-winning um, gross-out contests from uh, 2016 and 2018? And... I went ahead and I wrote a little um, interstitials, which I'm actually almost more proud of uh, than the stories themselves. Like the stories are great, you know, but you know they're gross-out stories, so they're just kind of a brief 
punchy little extreme horror piece. But I was actually really proud of um, the the real life stories that went along with that. And I was like, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's ever done this. So um, there was a little something different. Um, people got to read the gross out stories, which you normally cannot. People normally uh, leave those on the floor. Um, what happens at the gross out contest stays at the gross out contest is the you know common rule. Uh, but I, I, you know, I was very proud of them, and I was like, well, you know, whatever. Like many people say, uh, you know, you already put in the work; you might as well get some money for them. Uh, so that was Gorefest. Now, the reason I like normally I don't like to air my dirty laundry or whatever. I just wanted to tell you guys that that Sun Poison had a happy ending, um, which was that in December, um, and I don't have it. I, it just released, so either I didn't get my contributor copy or I'm not getting a contributor copy. But in uh, Battered Broken Bodies, which was edited by the legendary extreme horror author Matt Shaw, um, so I don't have it, but Battered Broken Bodies was also in December, and that contains Sun Poison. Um, so that was a uh, specifically a body horror um, anthology. And Matt liked Sun Poison. He's like, that's you know, perfect for this, um, you know, and it was really nice. I got invited to the anthology. It's, I love, if anybody ever wants to invite me to an anthology or anything like that, I greatly prefer that to the whole um, querying system. Um, so I had the three shorts published this year, uh, Gorefe Bludgeon Tools, Gorefest, Battered Broken Bodies, um, which was Tool Story, and then what I was calling the Terrible Two, which was my two um, award-winning gross-out stories, and then uh, Sun Poison in Battered Broken Bodies. I also published a novel this year. I didn't want to uh, go through the year without doing that, which was Broken Down Heroes of the Western Night. Very strange for me novel. Um, I was... I hope I'm not boring everybody with this story, but, you know, maybe if you're tuning in on New Year's, you haven't heard it before. Uh, this story is not horror, not extreme horror, not sci-fi, nothing speculative or uh, anything like what I usually publish. And I wrote this book about 2013, 2014. And what it is, is it's something of a... It's informed by real life, but I wouldn't describe it as like a Romana Clef or, a, you know, anything like that. It's not a true story. Jess Epley says, ending the year with 102 fever this year can suck it. Oh, sorry to hear that, Jess. And I was actually going to talk about you, so I'm glad that you're here. Um, that sounds ominous, but it, it's not at all. Uh, I was just going to talk about uh, one of Jess's books when I get one, one or two. Well, we'll see. Uh, I, I have my uh, list of books that I read for the year as well. So, uh, But sorry to hear that you're sick, Jess. I'm actually, fingers crossed, uh, not sick, but a lot of my family is sick this year, which is why I couldn't go to a New Year's party or anything. I, I was, Like I said earlier, I was going to hook up with uh, West Southern and, and Chris Triana and a couple of other people tonight, um, but it just... I don't want to endanger anybody. And Wes has a brand new baby, um, Nolan, and I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to endanger Nolan, so uh, sucks staying home. But I get to spend it with you folks, and you are clearly people of quality and taste. So, in a way, I'm the real winner here. <laughs> uh, so, Broken Down Heroes, it is a about my military experience but it's not like a biography or autobiography or anything like that one of the things i've been saying about it is um in the military you have a lot of kind of tall tales that are similar in concept to the way people used to tell fairy tales and and, and the point of the fairy tale is not there is a literal witch in the woods that will eat you the, you know the point of the fairy tale is don't go in the woods, you stupid peasants. You'll get eaten by bears or something. So this story was a lot of that. There's a lot of that in the military. So um, 
people will tell you a story, and the story is about Joe Snuffy, who is ostensibly real, but this is probably not a true story. This is probably a story to tell you, don't point your weapon in the air, or, or something. Um, so I gathered a lot of those stories, a lot of um, kind of tall tales and yarns and stuff, and, and some stuff that had happened to me, some stuff that had happened to friends of mine, and kind of crafted it into this novel. So, like, the closest thing I can describe this novel to is maybe, like, M.A.S.H. or uh, Catch-22 or something like that. It's it's kind of humorous. It's not real, like, gun porny, which is what I tend to think of. I wouldn't describe it as military fiction because it's not, like, uh, you know, talking about all the military hardware and stuff that people like to um, read in, in kind of Tom Clancy stories. Um, so it was, it's a very oddball little book, you know, by design. Um, I actually had this agent agented for a while in, um, 2018 and I got a lot of really nice, um, responses from New York, which was really great. Um, there was some talk, uh, that if I ever see you in person, maybe I'll tell you who with, but there was some talk in Hollywood uh, about some interest in this. But so far, nothing has panned out. So I decided, since this novel has been up and down the chain, it's been, you know, basically every place that it can possibly be published, it will be my first self-published novel. Um, and I went ahead and printed it under my uh, French press imprint. Uh, can you even see that? I keep forgetting where the camera is because I'm looking at the thing. So this was published under my French press imprint, which up until now I've used exclusively for uh, republishing books that were pre previously published into which I had, uh, you know, gotten my rights back. But this was the first original French press, and there may be more original French press novels this coming year. Maybe not even from me, but we'll see about that. Uh, more to follow there. Uh, so really good year. And just says self pubbing is the way to go. Total control. Yes. Uh, it's nice. Um, I don't trust myself with total control. So it, it's nice in some ways and, and uh, bad in some ways. Um, but that's, you know, the subject for hours and hours and hours of discussion. So before Jess goes, hopefully she'll stay with us the whole time, um, I wanted to talk about what I read this year, which was not a ton of new stuff, but that's fine. Um, I don't, I'm usually like way behind the curve on, um, you know, being caught up with, with reading. I'm usually reading some, you know, I have this whole thing where I'm like, I, I never feel like I'm caught up on, on the classics just says, LOL, it meaning self-publishing has its downside, but I prefer it. Good. Yeah, uh, there's a definitely proponents for self-publishing, and it's an important uh, important component of the industry. So let's talk about what I read this year. Um, so like I said, I'm not necessarily always trying to read the best stuff. I've got this thing where I want to read classics, I want to read my friends' stuff, I want to read what's important, and I, I you know, and, and pertinent this year, which I don't always get to. And then there's some stuff where I'm just like. Oh, I really want to fucking read that. So let's just go through the list, and I'll, I'll talk to you about this. So first thing I read was Patrick Rothfuss's The Wise Man's Fear. Now, Patrick actually blew up the industry, I think, a couple weeks ago by reading from his third book in the Name of the Wind series, which is just an incredible, incredible fantasy series, um, and which we kind of thought we were getting to the point where there was not going to be a third book. That's probably unfair, but he was kind of slow in bringing it out and people had begun to, you know, grow weary of that, which seems to be a problem, but maybe a problem that's baked into the whole fantasy genre in any case. So I read that. That's the second book in the uh, Name of the Wind. I read The Slow Regard of Silent Things by him. Uh, I mean, I don't know him, so sorry, Pat, if you really love this. Well, I know you do because I read your foreword. I really fucking hated this book. <laughs> And I understood what it was, so The Name of the Wind is all about language and the importance of language, which I'm a linguist, I'm, I'm a German major in college, I, I understand that, that's exciting to me. Um, he has this one character 
who grew up in the sewer, essentially, so she doesn't have the words for everything. So, like, she won't call a ball a ball. She'll call a ball, like, an apple without leaves or something. You know, like, that's... It's a whole linguistics thing for her. Um, and this story was from that character's perspective. Kenny Hughes says, Happy New Year to you, good sir. Happy New Year to you, Kenny. Um... And I, I didn't like it. It was it was too much. I mean, I understand why Patrick Rothfuss liked it, but I was, like, trying to figure... It wasn't super cogent. And I've even read, like, uh, uh, Clockwork Orange, which has its own, you know, uh, slang and that sort of thing. And I was like, I cannot pick up what this character is trying to do. Uh, like, I get that she's naming things that she doesn't understand, but I wasn't following it. Uh, I read The Tower of Zal by C.T. Phipps, which is the second book in the Cthulhu Armageddon series, which I actually pimped surprisingly well on a podcast uh, appearance earlier this year. Um, so uh, I love Phipps. I love all all of Phipps' works, almost without exception. And his uh, Cthulhu Armageddon is particularly good. I read Exotic Birds by Jessica Epley, who's on the chat here. And that, I want to say, was the second one in the series uh no no that was the first one exotic birds was the first one in this uh series that jess did um which is uh i'm not sure how i'd describe it maybe a kind of a criminal kind of like a crime thriller but it's clearly very humorous it's very uh tongue-in-cheek and the exotic birds was the first one and then i also read solve for x which was the second one but that was a little bit later in, in the year. Um, and those were both really good, so I hope there's a third one coming. Um, I read Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick by uh, David Wong, who is one of the few authors that I just I have to read everything he fucking writes. Uh, this book is full of spiders. is one of my all-time favorite books. Um, I just think he's a fucking genius. Okay, she just said first, second one is Solve for X. Okay. So, yeah, I read both of those this year, and that's what threw me off. I wasn't sure if I had read one in 2019 and, and or 2020 and the other one in 2021 or what. Uh, David Wong's Oh, He Punches the Future in the Dick, that's different series from his um, more famous uh, John Dies at the End series, but a very solid science fiction futuristic uh, series, which you guys should check out. I read The Lost Level by Brian Keane. Uh, I read Killing Rommel by Stephen Pressfield. Uh, Rommel, of course, and the Africa Corps being one of my favorite uh, components of all of history, and one of the things that I am extremely fascinated by. And Killing Rommel was great. It was actually from the perspective of the Desert Rats rather than the Africa Corps, so that was interesting. Uh, I read Touchy and Feely. I read two Graham Astertons in a row. I read Touchy and Feely, which was all right. Um, I read Descendant, which was also all right. So uh, I'll have to get with uh, Wes Southerd again sometime and uh, ask him what the real real Mastertons that'll really like get me going uh, are. Um, I did, however... Okay, just says Lost Level Series one of my favorites of Keen. Yeah, yeah, it was good. I understand I'm in the second one, so I'll, that's probably why I started it. Um, I read The Association by Bentley Little, which is really great. And I really fucking hated my old homeowners association, which we'll get to in a second. But that's what that was about, an evil homeowners association. Um, after I read Killing Rommel, I remember how much I fucking love Stephen Pressfield, who's an amazing author. I read The Afghan Campaign, ironically, earlier this year, um, which was just a brutal fucking... God, what a kick in the nuts that was. That was right up there with... Uh, what was the other one he did? Tides of War? Tides of War was really good. Gates of Fire was good, but you could tell it was kind of a juvenile work. Then Tides of War is where he really got into the... Um, he got into Alcibiades and the... Um, well, uh, that's, that's a story for another time. The more complicated character... Um, I read End of the Road by Brian Keene, which I was the hero of, so I enjoyed that. I actually read Little Britches by John Goodrich. I read that and um, did a blurb for it, so that's why I got to read that before anybody else. 
Um, so check out Little Britches. Check out my blurb. That's always very valuable. I read Cruel Summer by Wes Southerd, uh, which we talked about with him tonight. And uh, I think he may be appearing on the... Uh, well, what's that podcast called? The uh, Panic Room podcast uh, to talk about that at some point. I know that they were talking about that uh, over on the Splatterpunk uh, Extreme Horror site. I read With Teeth by Brian Keane. I read Until the Sun by uh, Chandler Morrison, who is a you know, big hotshot these days. Uh, well, I guess he's always been a hotshot, but uh, I've been hearing a particularly big amount about Chandler. So that was my first Morrison. And it was really good. It was so good. I also, and I've never done this before, I offered him a blurb for it. I don't know. If, you know, whatever. Maybe he'll use it. Maybe not. I don't, you know, I'm kind of nobody. But uh, it was so good, I had to let him know. Um, I read the Splatterpunk Award winning Magpie Coffin by my writing partner, uh, Wiley Young. Um, and that was really good. Uh, definitely check that out if you haven't. It's really worth the hype. Um, I read We Need to Do Something by Max Booth III. Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Moyer. Um, that was a uh, that was presented to me as a space horror, uh, but that is not how I would describe it at all. Uh, it was a very good um, fantasy. It was similar to Dune. Um, the best thing I could describe it as is uh, Dune with Necromancers. Um, so I get the part about how there's all the Necromancers and they're they're in this complicated space empire. Uh, so I get why it's that people were like, oh, it's like, you know, because in, in association with the Hematophages as a space um, horror writer guy myself, uh, that's why I read that. And it was not really what I was expecting, but it was very good. I read uh, Gone to See the River Man by Christopher Triana, which I talked to him about tonight. Um, that is a short... Uh, it's much shorter, I believe, than Full Brutal was. Um, and not as extreme, but in some ways psychologically more extreme. Um, it's very, uh, well, in true Triana fashion, fucked up book. Uh, fucked up main character who's just, you know, in some ways just really cruel and inhuman um almost shockingly so that you almost don't even realize she's painted as so uh kindly and understanding in the beginning that by the time you realize why she's so kindly and understanding at the end it's almost like he's pulled sort of a a, a sixth sense Shyamalan style twist on you um I finished Behind the Door by Mary San Giovanni uh, that is a good book, and I've been talking to Wiley Young about, uh, only slightly tongue-in-cheek, what I'd like to do is have, um, the, the magpie, the black magpie, come to the door, with the door, which is in Zarafath, which is a, uh, uh, you know, imaginary city in Pennsylvania. I said, why don't we have the black magpie go to Zarafath and make a wish at the door, for some something or other, and his wishes answered by the hematophages, and combine all three of those universes. But uh, we'll have to get a lot of people to sign off on that first. So uh, we'll see about that. Um, I read the Dinosaur Knights by the dearly departed Victor Milan, uh, which was the sequel to the Dinosaur Lords, I want to say. And basically, it's exactly what's written on the tin. It's uh, Game of Thrones with dinosaurs. Uh, this one got a little more into the strange stuff, which I think is going to, my guess, and I mean, you've already, uh, you've already, uh, uh, you know, the, the third one's already been out, so people already know, but my guess is it's going to turn out to be some kind of Matrix type thing where the world of the Dinosaur Knights was created by somebody and it's just like a Matrix or something. I, I don't know. I did my almost annual reread of The House on the Borderland, which go fucking read. If you haven't, read it every year. I do. Oh, and I read, uh, since it'll be the last one, I'll come back over to the camera. 
I read Killer Chronicles, which I have a signed copy. Uh made out to Pooh Bear, unless this this is the one that was also for my uh, girlfriend, which I also got, but yeah. Made out where Summer Cannon calls me Pooh Bear and says to enjoy the stripey cakes. Uh, this was a fucked up book, too. This was almost Triana level with the way that the uh, main character turned out to be a horrible person in the end. So, uh, definitely check that out. That's my second canon, and my second canon where she's blown me the fuck away. So, if you're not reading Summer Canon, uh, unfuck that. So I see Nathan Barney, uh, if my uh, Russian is serving me right, asks, do you plan for a sequel for Broken Down Heroes of the Western Night? Uh, thanks for that question, um, Nate. I don't have a plan. Uh, I When I had this with an agent... And she asked me, are you going to do more in this line? Um, I pitched her a story which was Cadetland. And so this story was about my time in the actual army. Um, and it was when I was fairly close to that time in my life. Um, I got out in 2008 and I wrote that in 2013. Uh, Cadetland would have been a similar story. Again, a pastiche of all of the... Um, you know, true stories and fairy tales and nonsense uh, regarding, you know, uh, but but from the perspective of an ROTC cadet. And uh, I'm quite a bit further away from that period in my life, which was 2000 to 2004. Um, so, I mean, I have, you know, I'd have to dig up all of my notes and journals and diaries and stuff from that era. But my idea was to do a spiritual successor, which would have been about being, you know, an ROTC cadet at that time frame, um, which I think could be interesting. Um, but that's definitely on the back burner. Um, maybe if tons of people buy Broken Down Heroes or if that uh, movie ever gets off the ground, you know, I, I, I'll admit it. I'm something of a mercenary person. I, I like to write uh, what people like to read and buy. So I, I try not to just keep putting out crap that nobody's interested in. But we'll see. Uh, yeah, but no, there's there's definitely is a uh, sort of a pitch for a sequel of a uh, spiritual successor because obviously, not to spoil the book, but that book would be fairly difficult to have a direct sequel to. Uh, maybe you could focus on different characters. Uh, so that's what I wrote this year. That's what I read this year. Um, in terms of what I got up to this year. Uh, we did Farpoint. Uh, that was virtual. That's a Baltimore convention in February. And I actually, I'm behind the curve because I have to f fill out my uh, participant survey for Farpoint 2022. Uh, that was in February, and that was all I did that year. That was virtual until Scares That Cares in July and August, which was great. That was a blast, as always. A um, little scary. Uh, to be back at a real live convention, but um, everyone wore masks. It was very safe. Um, I had a great reading with Jeff Strand, and I am actually reading my first Strand right now. Um, I've heard the guy read shorts and um, special, you know, shorter shorter pieces. That dude can fuck it right. <laughs> so I feel bad that I didn't get around to it until just now, but I'm reading one of the books I bought from him at uh, Scares this year. And that dude, he is a modern day Douglas Adams, um, who is probably, you know, one of my all time favorite authors. Um, so that was in West Virginia, Scares That Cares, that was great. I did Creature Feature Weekend in uh, Gettysburg, which is right down the road uh, here. Um, that was in late August, and that was fine. Um, that was when we were starting to get more scared of COVID again, and I was, you know, not super happy to be there. But again, um, you know, got to hang out with Triana and Cannon and Southern and all those people, um, which is, you know, in some ways more fun than selling books, unless you have a great weekend. And I finally, at the request of one of my fans, uh, Nate says, thank you, you're welcome. Jess says, hope to run into you at some comms this year. Yeah, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Uh, if not, let's just meet up at some point, because I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. Um, oh, and the last thing, my last appearance of the year was December 2nd. Um, 
and again, we were super safe. I finally combined my two worlds, which is the uh, balloon shop that I own and um, the writing. So I had a signing at the balloon shop. They they had a uh, the shop is located at a farmers market here down the road in, in Lemoyne, Pennsylvania. And at the farmers market, all of the specialty shops had a um, a holiday event this year. So for our event, because balloons aren't really a pick up and buy type item, we, we had some. We had some snowmen and stuff, and a few people bought some of that stuff. But uh, my business partner also asked me to sit and sell books. So I sold a couple of those, and that was really great. Oh, Matt Willison says, Happy New Year, all. Happy New Year, Matt. Hey, uh, don't forget, you're supposed to come on to one of these things. Uh, you promised me, well, you didn't promise anything, I guess, to be fair, but you told me you would. And I offered to do it on the biggest drinking day of the year, which is the, day, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So let me know. We're going to do another one of these with Matt Wildeson. I, I do have his promise that he's going to do that. But I'm not letting you off the hook of that for that, Matt. Um, so, oh yeah, Holiday Magic at the Market was great. Uh, I had a couple people uh, drive in from, you know, all over the place. That's always a flattering thing when uh, people come out just to see you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, fucking pandemic sucks. But what are you going to do about it? All you can do is try and be safe. And if you have to encounter people, you know, be as safe as possible. So in my other day job, I don't know, nothing very exciting happened. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. If, if you really want to know about it, uh, catch me sometime or ask me one of these questions. Matt says, I promise I will do this. Okay. All right. I'm holding your feet to the fire. Because that was supposed to be my 2021 uh, thing, was to have have a Wilderson episode. Um, yeah, so day jobs fucking boring. Gets more boring every day. Uh, but I, I, you know, I can't complain about it too much because I have the very good fortune to be able to work from home, and you know, it pays for all my vices like uh, losing money writing. Um, but. The big thing, the biggest thing that happened to me this year is some of you will have probably noticed, if you watch a lot of my videos, that the background of this one is very different. Uh, there's this ugly purple back here. And where you would normally see my Polish flag and my American flag, which uh, I may get back up here, you're actually seeing my... Uh, wow, this is really weird to do backwards in a camera. This is actually my brag shelf, okay? Okay. So what's up there is like a piece of uh, fan art that uh, Christine Morgan made for me. That's a skin wrapper. I mean, I probably can't see this stuff really well, but uh, that's a lamp that a, a fan made for me. Uh, that's a Ghoul Archipelago mug that um, my uh, audiobook narrator made for me. Uh, and uh, that's some grave dirt from uh, Robert E. Howard. Uh, that my writing partner Wiley Young got for me. Everything up here is a uh, trophy or a symbol of you know my writing career in some fashion. Um, but the reason why the background is different is because I'm in a new house. So this is my definitely my first video since that happened. Um, if you have not bought a house this year, I bought. Okay, the other big thing I did this year was I bought a car, but that's kind of boring. But let me tell you, buying a car in the pandemic is a goddamn nightmare. I spent way more than I should have. Jess says, someone needs to make you a clonosaurus. That sounds like something for um, the animal lover, doesn't it? To make me some kind of articulated uh, clony uh, doll or something. So I'll, I'll wait on that from you, Jess. Um, I bought a car. I paid way too much for not enough, um, and everyone was just like, "There's, they're not making cars, so used cars are worth the whole fuckload. The one nice thing for you is you'll get a little more at trade-in, and I was like, okay, great, I, you know, I'll got a thousand dollars at trade-in instead of the normal 200 that you get, um, 
So that was a big, hard fucking fight. And I think that was probably the third or fourth car that I've bought in the last year or two between buying the van for the business, um, buying a new car for my girlfriend, buying another new car for my girlfriend um, after she was just fucking T-boned at an intersection. Not her fault at all. Uh, And then I had to buy my new car. So... I guess that's four fucking cars I've had to buy in the last, like, two years or something. And it's just exhausting. And I was just like, here's what I want. It shouldn't be that hard, but in the pandemic, it is goddamn impossible. Houses are like that times 50. Now, I heard a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but apparently somebody offered to name their firstborn after the seller and still did not get the house. So whether that's apocryphal or not, that was definitely my experience. I spent all year, all year, looking for a house, and we were not picky. We wanted a house where we could move, air studio. Uh, so essentially, we, we needed a house that was about the size of ours, plus about the size of the studio, wrap it all up, um, you know, just have a home studio, and, you know, maybe, you know, we had, everybody has, you know, the wish list. I'm like, I want a pool, I want a, you know, a hot tub, or this or that. Um, You know, we wanted a yard, we wanted trees, you know, stuff like that. But other than that, we're not very picky people. We just needed a certain sized house. And you would think that we were trying to land the fucking SpaceX module on Mars or something. Uh, we were undercut. We were outbid. We put in bids for 10000 more than the house is worth and still didn't get the house. I was outbid by nearly $70,000 on a house. And when that happened, I was like, well, honestly, he can have that for that much more. I, I will live. Um, so it was just this endless fight. Um, but we found a realtor. Shelly Hawkins, who she said, make sure you tell people about me. So here you go, Shelly. I'm telling people about you. Uh, Shelly Hawkins of EXP Realty. Um, And for the last three or four months of the hunt, um, she came out and hunted with us. And we finally found this place. And it's great. It's so amazing to finally be here. Um, One of the components of the moving during a pandemic thing was everything had to be like real we had to agree to like 30 days in closing and you know i had to agree to a bunch of shit i I did not name my firstborn after them um but pretty much everything else that you could possibly ask for i had to do so we found this new house this beautiful home um we've got the yard we've got the trees we've got the space We've got the space for the studio. We've got this ugly-ass purple uh, paint on my wall here. Um, But we had to real, real quick pack up, um, move, and then for the last two weeks or so, we've been unpacking. So thankfully, the camera angle is good here. You cannot see that I am surrounded by shit Uh, because I have that... I'm like, oh, let me get this, uh, you know, brag shelf in order for the video. But if you could see down, Giuseppe says, I actually like that paint. Okay. To each their own. Um, but yeah, I am surrounded by shit right now. Um, we are trying desperately to unpack. We've been just pulling, like, the equivalent of all-nighters every night. Luckily, I guess the one saving grace is it's the dead holiday season, so... You know, I've been able to kind of check out from the day job and take a lot of time off and just unpack and, you know, hopefully get this place into some kind of working order. And then and then in January, we have the whole process of uh, getting the studio moved. Um, so I didn't end up selling my old house. Um, I'm actually renting it to a good friend uh, and illustrator, uh, Chris Enterline. So if you've if you're friends with Chris and you've noticed that he is doing a bunch of renovations, um, he's a handyman in his day job, or maybe contract. I always call him a handyman. I don't know if that's cool to say anymore. You know, he's a guy that actually does stuff with his hands, not like me. Uh, 
so if you've noticed that he's been um you know ripping out a bunch of old carpets and crap like that uh he you know that's his rent to buy uh townhouse which was my old townhouse um so it's you know in a great it's it's kind of great like i'm really happy to you know have this good fortune to have this new house um the kitties kiko who never did actually come in but okay i guess i can't blame her for that um kiko was actually really like shitty the first couple of days that she was here which i understand the old owners had dogs and cats and, and you know matt says if you need any help moving the studio let me know i don't mind okay thanks matt i will uh i'll let my partner know that um it, actually we probably will with the helium tanks I think we can handle everything except the helium tanks, which take two large men uh, in most cases. So now I'm glad I've got you on the hook for that. Um, what was I saying? Oh, Kiko was being shitty. Uh, and I think what she was doing was following the scent trails of a bunch of unfamiliar animals for a while. But I guess that has died down, and she's acting a little more like herself. Uh, so the kitties are settling in. Um, we're settling in, uh, the dining room and the, and the master bedroom are finally, uh, uh, you know, in something like a livable fashion. It'll certainly be a while before we get the studio up and running, but I guess I'll work on my office next and, you know, all this other stuff, but, uh, it's just a monumental undertaking. Okay. Amy Lauer. I hope you were on Amy to hear Matt Wildeson promise to help move the helium tanks. Amy says... Kiko has been in the kitchen staring at me for the last half hour. Uh, okay. Well, I guess that's good. That's better than staring at the evil uh, Bigfoot face that you got for the uh, for the window. So we have a, a, a back porch now. Or uh, I should say we have a front porch and a back um, patio. And on the glass doors to the back patio, um, Amy got a really lovely it's really quite cute um cat bed so you attach it to the the glass and then the cat can get into it and be like "Ooh, i'm outside uh but it has the face of a cat on it so i walked by it this morning and i was like oh my god bigfoot it's just that weird uncanny valley out of the corner of your eye and i was like what is that oh yeah that's that thing and the cats have all been like acting weird and scared of it too and i'm like i wonder if they're scared of the face too like i that doesn't seem like good cat psychology to me but i'm like maybe i don't know it freaked me out because it looked like a face but you know um we're out in the country now so bigfoot sightings are definitely a concern and matt promises just let me know when i'll be there all right we will we'll hold you to that so yeah i think that is my 2021 in a nutshell or here's, ah, I'm in a nutshell. That's me in a nutshell. I know that's that's a joke that gets more relevant every day. Uh, thank you to uh, Austin Powers for bringing us that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's been great. Um, I think 2022 is going to be better. Uh, you know, you should always hope for that, I guess. Uh, one thing I definitely know is happening in 2022 is Clickers Never Die by myself and the aforementioned Wiley Young will be coming out at some point in wide release. Oh, that's the other thing that came out in, in 2021 was the uh, limited release of Clickers Never Die. Um, so expect that to come out in wide release next year. That's definitely happening. I have also sold a new Hematophages short story um, to... Oh, crap. What are they called? Uh, n nocturnal nocturnal Nightmares books or something like that? Well, I hope, I hope they don't see this video. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I sold a Hematophages short story. Not just a Hematophages short story, but a Hematophages short story that checks back in with the Borgvart. It's, it's in the past, obviously. If anybody read the novel, they know what happens to the Borgvart. But uh, we get to see some of your favorite characters again, albeit briefly. Um, and they and this will be where Hematophages was like my vampire novel set in space. 
this short story is something of a haunted house set in space. Uh, just simply says, how many Clickers novels are there? I read the first one this year. That's a good question, Jess. There are three primary novels. There's Clickers 1, Clickers 2, Dagon Rising, and Clickers 3, which is like the Deluge or something. Um, so there's three primary Clickers novels that had J.F. Gonzalez writing on them. There is also Clickers vs. Zombies, which is considered to be uh, divergent from that universe. So there are Clickers in it, and there are uh, Zombies from the Rising in it, but that they're not like, you know, the, you know the deal. It's it's an alternate universe. It's the same universe where the, you know, the Ghostbusters are ladies, and the you know I, I don't know, I don't know how these things work. But Clickers vs. Zombies is considered to be a different universe from the three primary Clickers books. Then there's Clickers Forever, which features uh, remembrances of J.F. Gonzalez and some shorts, and some of those shorts are considered to be in continuity, I guess. Um, Clickers Never Die, which will... So there's three primary, the one diversionary, and then the one that's kind of nonfiction anthology, combination mishmash kind of thing. So that's five. Clickers Never Die will be six, and that is set in another different timeline. So that's a, a third, completely different timeline. Want to make sure that's clear to everybody up front. We put in a bunch of forwards and, and afterwards and stuff being clear. Like, if you're looking for continuity with the original Clickers series, you're not going to find it here. Uh, so we were as clear as possible on that. Uh, so yeah, if you just read the first one... Um, second one's a real treat uh the third one second one's the one that's all about the bush years with the crazy president um that that, that one was a hoot and that actually takes place parts of it take place here in new york county um yes i, I guess i just outed myself online i am now officially a resident of york county pennsylvania which is in some ways terrifying but here we are. Like I said, it's a beautiful house. Um, so if there aren't any other questions or anything like that, and I hopefully I didn't get too distracted, but we have been going on for almost an hour now, which I was hoping to avoid this year, but I like talking to you people for as long as possible, but I don't know how long you like to talk to me. Uh, Jess Epley says, lol, clickers during the Trump years would be interesting. Well then, you're going to love clickers never die, Jess, because those are set during World War Two and the Trump years. Uh, it's kind of a, a framing story set in 2020 where they dive and find um, uh, uh, another story about World War Two. Jess Epley says, hey, what part of York are you in? That's my area. Uh, I'll text you that. I don't want that to go out to everybody. Um, oh, yeah, well... Um, yeah, well, I think that's... Okay, Jess simply says, we've got the best clickers, huge claws. Oh, uh, the, um, like the Baltimore crabs and that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, one of those things that this area is famous for, that and Old Bay. Um, so yeah, you know, there's some other stuff that went on this year, but, you know, I think that's the main thing. And uh, if we don't have any other questions or comments or anything... I need to continue unpacking this house and maybe have some dinner and maybe get some of that done before the actual New Year tonight. So, hopefully you've all charged your glasses and prepared for this toast. So I will say to all of you, thank you for being my friends. Thank you for being my fans. Thanks for all the sh support. Oh, no. Okay, just says it was a Trump joke, LOL. Okay. Oh, the clickers have the best claws. All right. Okay. Now back to the mushy stuff. So thank you to all of you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for making this job, this writing career possible. I'm looking forward to big things next year. Thank you for this last year. And I hope that you all do really well in your personal lives, your professional lives, whatever's important to you, health, 
wellness. Nothing but the best. This is my favorite holiday of the year. It always is. I love New Year's because it's just got so much promise. So here's to you and yours. Nazdrovi. Okay. And that's another New Year's toast down. Thanks, everybody, and we will see you in 2022.